Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to get started with this uh, session right now. So thank you all for coming this early morning uh, for this session on um, pathogenesis of infection. So this session will touch briefly on the pathogenesis of infection in CF um, with emphasis on pathogen airway migration and motility, as well as polymicrobial interaction. Um, we have a lot of uh, very interesting talks today. Um, the selected abstracts for presentations will discuss common CF pathogens and their ability to survive, multiply, and or evade um, host immune systems during different stages of colonization and post therapies. So just to introduce myself, my name is Amanda and I'm a research associate at the Hospital for Sick Kids in Toronto. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you, can you all, is my, is my, okay. I am Jennifer Honda. Nice to see everyone. Welcome to our session. We're super excited to, to be here. Uh, I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center, and we're very excited that our speakers uh, ex excitedly accepted our invitation. And so we have a great lineup, like Amanda said, and we're excited to get started. So the first, without further ado, can we call up Sam? Great. So this is Samantha Durfrey. She's from the University of Washington. She's a postdoctoral fellow. Um, and so her talk today is bronchoscopy sampling finds that intralung bacterial migration contributes to persistent pseudomonas originosa infection after ETI. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Okay, yeah, okay, I'm broadcasting. Hello everyone, thank you all for coming today, especially to this early 7 a.m. session. So really appreciate that and I appreciate the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I mean, I'm excited to have the opportunity to tell you about the work I've been doing in Pradeep and Allison's lab where we've been studying how intralung migration of Pseudomonas aeruginosa contributes to widespread lung infection after correcting the CFTR. So the large observational study promise recently showed that about two thirds of subjects remain chronically infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa after starting Aluxacaftor, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor, despite marked improvements in clinical parameters and CFTR activity. A key question motivating research in Pratip's lab right now is why do Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections persist after CFTR is corrected? And the hypothesis that we were interested in testing is that persistent infection after CFTR correction is due to structural lung damage. Here I'm showing an example lung from a person with CF where you have areas of high damage and areas of low damage. And we thought that these high damaged regions may cause persistent infection because of impaired mucus clearance, dampened immune responses, and higher bacterial density. And most importantly, lung damage in non-CF bronchiectasis leads to infection and removing those damaged regions can cure infection. And so this establishes a link between damage and infection irrespective of CFTR status. In order to test our hypothesis, we conducted a bronchoscopy study where we sampled the highest and lowest damaged lung regions within subjects before and after they started ETI. We used CT scans to, to identify the two highest and three lowest damage regions in each subject, and then sampled these five regions using bronchoscopy and regional lung washing. And importantly, we used a new disposable bronchoscope to sample each region in order to reduce cross-contamination between the regions. We then repeated the bronchoscopy a year and a half after subjects started ETI, and in all, we studied nine adults who had chronic pseudomonas lung infections. Now, I want to start by showing you two general patterns of infection persistence that emerged from our data. Here, I'm showing an example of one single subject before and after ETI. Along the y-axis, we have the pseudomonas density expressed as colony-forming units per mil of recovered BAL fluid. Um, and then each of these dots is one lung region in that subject, and I've color-coded them by the high and low damage regions. And so you can see that in this subject, all five lung regions cleared pseudomonas, and so this patient eradicated their pseudomonas infection. And we had three of our nine subjects follow this pattern. Now, in contrast, um, the remaining six subjects followed the second pattern, where all five lung regions were positive before and after ETI. And so in these six subjects, both those high and low damage regions remained infected. And importantly, the low damage regions in these subjects had a very similar degree of damage as the regions that eradicated Pseudomonas. And so initially, this suggested to us that our hypothesis may have been incorrect. 
However, we realized that there are actually two different models that could explain finding widespread infection after ETI. So in the first and simplest model, widespread infection may be caused by local persistence of all of the subpopulations. And so what I mean by that is that the Pseudomonas that existed in region one and region two before ETI persisted and gave rise to the pseudomonas that we found there after ETI. And if we found this, it would suggest that lung damage indeed does not contribute to infection persistence. However, we also thought that it was possible that certain regions could persist um, and then migrate to colonize other regions that cleared after ETI. And so if we found this model, it would suggest that the regions with local persistence are the regions that we need to focus on because those are the sites of infection persistence. Now, we can distinguish between these models because the pseudomonas in the different lung regions are genetically distinct from one another, so that we can use DNA to distinguish pseudomonas from the different regions. Now, I'm not suggesting that these need to be different strains in the different regions. Usually they are clonally related isolates that have evolved independently in the different lung regions, so that you end up with unique genetic signatures linked to location. Now I wanna show you an example of how we know that these isolates are genetically distinct. We start by sequencing the whole genomes of 100 Pseudomonas isolates per region, and then infer a phylogenetic tree. On that phylogenetic tree, the isolates are going to be color-coded by the location from which they were sampled, and I'm showing you that location key right here. Now here we have the phylogenetic tree showing the genetic relationship among the isolates collected before ETI from a single subject. And so closely related isolates are going to cluster together on this tree. And what we found was that there was clustering by location as indicated by color. And what this means is that the pseudomonas in different lung regions are genetically distinct from one another. And thus there are unique genetic signatures that we can use to distinguish isolates from the red region, from the purple region, from the blue region, etc. Now, let me show you how we're going to infer the ancestor location of those post-ETI isolates. We start by building a phylogenetic tree using the pre-ETI isolates, like I just showed you on the last slide. In this um, hypothetical right here, the isolates are color-coded by the region from which they were collected, and I've made them perfectly genetically distinct. We then sample and sequence um, the post-ETI isolates, and because we form, performed that second bronchoscopy, we know exactly which region they were found in. We then add the sequences to the phylogenetic tree and look for patterns of descent. So for example, these three isolates here are color-coded red because they are descendants of the isolate in region one. These isolates over here color-coded yellow because they're the descendants of region two. And this isolate is a really interesting example because it was sampled in region two, but is actually a descendant of region one. And so this is an example of what migration would look like in our data. Now, in this hypothetical, I'm only showing you 12 isolates, but in our real data set, we're usually analyzing about 800 isolates per subject. And so I needed a way to summarize this phylogenetic data for you. And I chose to do that using pie charts that represent the proportion of isolates that descend from each of the pre-ETI regions. Now, I'm gonna walk you through two examples to kind of demonstrate some of the different patterns we found in patients before I summarize across all of our subjects. In this first subject, here we have the pre-ETI key. In the first region, we found that 100% of the isolates are the descendants of the red region, and so this indicates local persistence in this region. In the second region, we found 100% of the isolates are the descendants of the purple region, again, indicating local persistence. Now, when we looked across the rest of the regions, we found that all of these isolates are the descendants of the purple region, indicating migration from the purple region and into these other regions after ETI. And so in this subject, most of the post-ETI subpopulations were the result of migration. Now, for the second subject, we again find evidence of local persistence, this time in about three, in, sorry, in three of the regions. Then in the fourth region, we see evidence of migration, but actually from two different regions. And then this region is why I'm showing you this subject. This is one of the few regions where we found evidence of a mixture between 
locals as indicated by the blue and migrants as indicated by the rainbow over here. And so in this subject, they had more regions that were the result of local persistence, and they had one of the few regions with any mixture between migrants and locals. Now, to summarize across all of our subjects, I'm going to really simplify things and just talk about them as either locals or migrants. Along the x-axis, I'm going to be showing you all of the lung regions across our persistently infected subjects. And then along the y-axis, we have the percent of post-ETI isolates that are derived from either locals or migrants. And so what this first bar means is that in this lung region, 100% of the isolates were the result of local persistence. Now, when we looked across the rest of the regions, we noticed two really interesting things. So first, nearly half of the lung regions are dominated by migrants after ETI, which suggests that migration contributes to that widespread lung infection that we found after ETI. Additionally, we found that there were very few regions that were um, a mixture between locals and migrants, and so either locals or migrants dominated post-ETI. We don't fully understand why this is happening yet, but we thought it was really interesting nonetheless. And so just to summarize what I've shown you thus far, post-ETI pseudomonas infections affect both the high and low damage lung regions, and half of all of the lung regions cleared their initial pseudomonas populations and became reinfected by pseudomonas migrating from other regions. And so I've shown you that this migration pattern can happen after ETI, but I haven't addressed yet which regions hold the locals and which regions are infected by the migrants. And so for the final part of my talk, um, I wanna address this hypothesis. And so going back to our initial hypothesis where we thought that lung damage would drive persistent infection, we hypothesized that low damage regions would be more likely to clear pseudomonas and become reinfected by the migrant pseudomonas. In order to test this hypothesis, um, we used a semi-quantitative CT-based measure of lung damage shown here along the y-axis, where higher numbers indicate higher degrees of damage. We then compared the, the pre-ETI lung damage between local infected and migrant infected regions. And we found that indeed, the local infected regions had a much higher degree of starting lung damage than the migrant infected regions, which suggests that lung damage contributes to the ability of pseudomonas to persist after ETI. Oh, I did not bring my water. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. And so now, if if we really thought that the migrant <coughs> the migrant dominated regions cleared their initial infection and were reinfected, we would expect that the starting damage in the migrant dominated regions would be very similar to the regions that eradicated Pseudomonas. And that is indeed what we found. Okay, so today I've shown you that Pseudomonas is found in both the high and low damage lung regions after ETI, and that regions with higher damage usually remained infected by the regional Pseudomonas subpopulations that were present there before ETI. In contrast, regions with less damage generally cleared their, the Pseudomonas populations that were present there before ETI. Some of them remained Pseudomonas free in the people who eradicated, and some of those became recolonized by migrants. Thus, we think that host defenses may improve enough in those low damage regions to clear the initial pseudomonas, but not enough to prevent reinfection by the adapted subpopulations. And all of this together suggests to us that clinical outcomes may be improved by boosting host defenses in high damage regions so that they can also clear, or and or by blocking the pseudomonas functions that enable intralung migration. And truly, all together, this suggests to us that lung damage may be the key to infection persistence after ETI. And so if we can prevent lung damage altogether, we may prevent infections as well. And so with that, I'd like to thank everyone involved in this study. This is a really huge undertaking, and it was a collaboration between the University of Washington and University of Iowa. So we had research subjects both in Iowa and in UW, or and at UW. And so I want to thank the UW clinical team, the Iowa clinical team, there is an Iowa research team. Um, and then Allison, Fetter, and Iris are collaborating with me on the migration analyses. Um, and then Jason Woods and Matthew Wilmering provided the CT scan analysis for lung damage. 
And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. That was a great talk. If anyone has questions, please come up to the microphone. And if you don't mind introducing yourself and then asking your question, thank you so much. That was a lovely talk. Luann Hall Studley from Ohio State University. Um, I'm interested about the word migrant. Yeah. And in because Pseudomonas is the motile organism, how much you're factoring in the shear in the lung from areas that could you know, cause colonization downstream from, you know, airway, airway flow. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think so. So are you asking about like, um, let's see here, essentially, are there, uh, essentially, are there common patterns of migration maybe? Um, yeah. And do they yeah. follow, do they, would they follow kind of neutral patterns of migration? Like if you were to just inhale particulate matter? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Because I think of Pseudomonas as being constantly, you know, from the upper airway, but, you know, people cough up and then um, will yes. inhale, part, you know, bacteria back into the lungs. So I just wonder how much the the yeah. shear from lung uh, yeah. airflow. Yeah, yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So we're still parsing like the pre-ETI migration rates, but I can tell you that it's not like, I expected that because of gravity, you know, all of the migration would happen from the upper regions into the lower regions. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, sometimes that happens in patients, but there are other patients where there are lower to upper migrations. Um, and then, other things that we expected were that, you know, we sometimes sampled multiple segments in the same lobe. Um, and so we expected intra lobe would be a higher migration rate. And that's also not necessarily mm -hmm. what we see in some patients. That is definitely the case. But there are other patients who the pseudomonas can go left to right, right to left, and it does not seem to care. So mm -hmm. I'm really fascinated to learn more to like figure out more about this. But yeah, thank you. Great. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm Marta. I'm a postdoc in Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Hi. It's a very exciting talk. Uh, I'm more interested in like genomic features of Pseudomonas ah. here. There's some lineage that clearly go extinct after ETI, yes. some that gain dominance. I'm wondering, have you guys tried maybe competing them or looking at genomics of what are the features that might make them more fit or less fit in, yeah. like, during the ETI treatment? No, that's an excellent question. Um, unfortunately, we're in the middle of doing the bacterial GWAS studies right now to try and identify genetic signature, like genetic signatures associated with persistence. So I don't have an answer for you yet, but that is like in the pipeline. And so I'm, I will be super excited to be able to tell you more about that. Cool. Have you tried com just competing them, just taking two isolates and uh, seeing which is more fit? No. We haven't tried that. I, I'm not sure that we have the right, I guess we could do it in like a mouse model or something. I'm not sure what the right condition would be. Um, but yeah, no, that's an interesting question. Thank you. Cool. Hi, thank you for your talk. Thank I'm you. Chris, also a postdoc at Kaiser School of Medicine at Dartmouth. Um, so my question is related to your other uh, pseudomonas yes. that showed up in the lung. Yeah. So I'm wondering if those show any hallmarks of being like new infection or if they show hallmarks uh, of being yes. previously in the lung, like can you tell maybe yes. where they came from? Yes, that's an excellent question. And so those others are definitely the same strain. So it looks like they are still part of that same initial infection. However, we think that because of essentially we can't identify where they come from because of where they meet back in the phylogenetic tree. And so we assume that they come from one of the other many regions that we didn't sample before ETI. But yeah, thank you. Hi, great talk. Thank you. Question though. Yeah. Can you introduce Speaking yourself about, as well yeah. to you? Oh, Carlos Miller from Stanford. Speaking about origins of Pseudomonas infection in CF, do you do any upper way sampling? No, we didn't and I wish we had. As you know, we'll think about this yeah. as, you know, from sinus or just upper way. Just yeah. with inspiratory flow, it's going to go to open areas, not close that much areas. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's an excellent question. If we were to do the study in the future, I think we'd definitely be adding sinuses. Thank you. Hold on just Hi. one second. Ooh. Hold on just let me figure online question. Oh, okay. So we have one question from um, 
Rebecca Bowles, really, uh, really cool work. Have you looked at local metabolite nutrients in high damage regions that may encourage more persistent strains? Yeah, that's a really excellent question. Um, we just got back some metabolomics data. It's not, we didn't do a full panel of metabolomics, um, but we do see that there are higher concentrations of like free amino acids in the higher damage regions. And so there is like, it'll be interesting to get out what the underlying mechanism of persistence in the high damage regions are. It seems like there is slightly higher concentrations of amino acids there. The other thing that we thought would be like a, a kind of like uh, a really obvious question was the C, like the number of CFUs in the region. However, we don't see any difference in the starting concentration of pseudomonas, but thank you so much. That's a great question. And then the final question. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Hi, uh, Ryan Cunnington, University of Manitoba. This might kind of relate. I was wondering if you looked at like the bacterial load or bacterial numbers um, to see if there were, whether there's like a threshold. I know that like in one of your early slides, you had the patients that cleared it had it slightly less than maybe the the persistent ones. I was wondering if you could. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we actually. So let's see here. If you look at patients who clear versus patients who. Um, don't clear. There was no difference in starting CFU. And then also, like I said, regions that remained locally infected versus became infected by migrants, we again didn't see any difference in the starting CFU, which yeah, is pretty kind of surprising, but awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sam. Great talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Elizabeth Bergener, and her talk is airway infection with pseudomonas harboring filamentous phage at high levels is associated with lung function decline in longitudinal cystic fibrosis cohort. Great, thank you for the introduction and thank you for including me in this workshop today. Um, I'm excited to talk about my work on pseudomonas and filamentous phage and uh, effects in a longitudinal cohort. I am, um, I will say that all of the work that I did for this was done while I was at Stanford. I've more recently um, relocated to Children's Hospital Los Angeles. I have nothing to disclose. Wait, where did it go? There we go. Um, all right, I know CF needs no introduction in this audience, but um, I will point out that our patients with CF are born with structurally normal lungs. They quickly develop thickened, dehydrated mucus. They get exposed to bacteria from the environment. There's an influx of immune cells. We get this vicious cycle of infection and inflammation that we all know that we can't clear. And um, Pseudomonas is the most common organism, <clears throat> excuse me, cultured from CF sputum. Forms biofilms, it's very resistant, and we know it's associated with poor outcomes in CF. So biofilms are communities of bacteria that are encased in polymers. Think about a dental plaque. Um, and this also occurs in the airways of our patients with CF. And biofilms confer adhesion, antibiotic tolerance, and immune evasion. And we know that in Pseudomonas biofilms, bacteriophage gene expression is actually quite upregulated. So in this study, looking at um, Pseudomonas grown in a biofilm versus grown in planktonic or grown planktonically, um, the top nine genes upregulated come from the PF bacteriophage, with the most upregulated being the CoAB or co protein of PF phage, which is activated 83-fold. So very um, highly expressed. So what is the PF phage? So PF stands for filamentous or pseudomonas filamentous bacteriophage, and it's a non-lytic phage. It's a um, long, skinny string of a virus. It's got a protein coat. There's a uh, single-stranded DNA genome that's kind of folded back on itself in there, and there's some cap proteins and some tail proteins. Um, the cap recognizes uh, type 4 pilus on pseudomonas and injects the DNA. It incorporates into the bacterial chromosome, so it is a prophage. And then some stimulus or stress um, uh, causes it to excise into the rep replicative form, and basically the pseudomonas produces a bunch of phage particles and extrudes them. But the key is that it does not lyse pseudomonas when it does this. So this is a pseudolysogenic replication cycle. Lysogenic because it is a prophage, but pseudo because it doesn't ever really go into the lytic phase. So I will pause here and say this is not a talk about phage therapy. This phage is um, a filamentous non-lytic phage um, that is more of a virulence factor of pseudomonas and it's present in many clinical uh, pseudomonas isolates. And so phage, this, this phage can assemble um, polymers into liquid crystals. And what I mean by that, so you see um, this guy right here is calcite, it's a crystal. You can't see it, that's all right. Um, 
And uh, when you look through that, you can see the, the line right through it, right? But you turn that crystal and it looks like that line is shifted. That's because the light is refracted by the crystal. That's birefringence. So in that top panel, you can see a colony of pseudomonas that is fade, PF phage negative, does not produce PF phage. Take a polarizing lens and you rotate it and it looks uniform. But you have a, right below that, you have a colony of pseudomonas that is phage, PF phage producing. You rotate that lens and you see areas of irregularity. That's birefringence. So there's a liquid crystal. And we call it liquid crystal because it's not quite solid, but it has properties of a crystal. And this is organized or is done um, through depletion attraction. So the phage, that coat protein, that alpha helix that's um, organized as the coat protein, all the little negatively charged amino acids stick out. So it's a highly negatively charged surface. And then all of the polymers that are in biofilms and sputum, alginate, hyaluronin, DNA, we know there's a ton of DNA in CF sputum, they're all negative too. So it's through those negative charges that it organizes into liquid crystal. And we know from in vitro work that PF phage um, liquid crystal in biofilms in comparison to non-PF phage biofilms are more viscous, they're more resistant to desiccation, they inhibit phagocytosis more, and they limit antibiotic diffusion more. So all things that you would think might make a pseudomonas infection worse. So our hypothesis was that PFH promotes chronic infection and leads to worse outcomes in CF. So, and we know phage is present in the CF airway. So this was, this is kind of a summary of my fellowship project, but um, I looked at this um, genomes in the pseudomonas genome database, over 2000 genomes. And because it's a prophage, you can look for the phage in the, in the pseudomonas genome. And 52% of those isolates had sequences of PF phage. Then I looked at a Danish CF cohort from a longitudinal study with over 400 um, pseudomonas isolates, and 45% of those contained sequences from PF phage. And then um, I collected sputum samples from um, patients at Stanford that had, had pseudomonas in their sputum, and I performed qPCR on the sputum looking for the phage and identified 36% of those had PF phage detectable in their sputum. When we look at the, the qPCR, the quantitative levels, um, you can see here we've got um, the log of phage concentration versus the log of the pseudomonas concentration. And if it was a one-to-one -one relationship, you'd, that would be right on that dotted line, but it's shifted up. So there's one to two logs higher of um, phage in the sputum than there is of pseudomonas. And it, it's really high concentrations. It's like on the order of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 10 phages per ml of sputum. So there's a lot of it. So in this cross-sectional cohort at Stanford, we um, also looked at some of the clinical information. So looking at um, applying LEADS criteria to these patients to look at chronic pseudomonas, we can see that the PF positive, the navy blue bar, 100% um, of those met criteria for chronic infection were only 65% six, of those that were PF negative met um, criteria. So maybe indicating that it's associated with chronic infection. And then you know, lung function is complicated to look at, but in this cohort, what we did is we looked at when patients presented an exacerbation, how much their lung function dropped. So baseline being the best FEV1 in the last six months, and then when they presented an exacerbation where they were, and you can see again the PF positive in the navy blue had a larger drop in lung function during exacerbation, so maybe indicating these patients were sicker or became sicker. Um, so now we have um, five years of basically follow-up, so I was able to enroll more patients in that cohort. We ended up with 121, um, spanning 2016 to 2021. You'll note that ETI received FDA approval kind of towards the end of that and the COVID pandemic hit. So altered our sample collection a bit, um, but we had 121 patients, over 300 sputum samples. And when looking at the patients, each patient as a whole, um, so the 121 patients, uh, more than half of them had pseudomonas in every sputum sample. I will say this is based on the qPCR, so we do pick up more um, pseudomonas than say the culture does. Um, and then a little bit more than a quarter had never had pseudomonas in their sputum. And then there was that kind of striped pie chart or wedge there of patients that sometimes had pseudomonas in their sputum and sometimes did not. And then looking at phage status, about 25% about always had phage in their sputum. And then there's another, that, you know, again, striped wedge that had um, some samples with PF and some without. And then that PF negative chunk, that includes all of the pseudomonas negative patients. We never, I never detected PF phage in a sputum sample if I didn't detect pseudomonas. So looking at study uh, subject characteristics at entry, um, we do see a difference in age. So our PF positive patients are older than both the um, pseudomonas negative and the, the pseudomonas positive, but PF negative. And that also was true in the original cross-sectional cohort. When we look at chronic infection, again, at study entry, um, we see a little bit more variability here. And we have a couple that are negative because the LEADS criteria are retrospectively applied. but. Um, but we do see that there is significantly more chronic infection in our PF positive patient group. 
And then when we look at lung function at entry, you can see we have a wide range of lung function in all three categories, um, but there was no, no difference between um, lung function, FEV1% predicted at entry. And then looking at modulator use, as it's <laughs> quite important and um, affects our, our patients significantly during, so at, um, you can see in yellow is those that were on a highly effective modulator at entry, which is mostly Ivacaftor because it started in 2016. Um, or only Ivacaftor, I guess. And then the red are the ones that started on either Ivacaftor or um, ETI. And then the purple are those that did not start on any um, HEMT. And there was no difference in the, in the groups and modulator use. And then also looking at kind of our big outcome in CF, um, if patients progress to death or lung transplant, um, you can see that in each of the three categories, we had some patients that passed or progressed to lung transplant, but again, no significant difference between the three groups. When we look at lung function over time, um, it gets a little more interesting. So um, again, here we have FEV1 decline um, in percent predicted per year. So it is accounting for the entire um, length in the study and change over time. You can see in our pseudomonas negative patients, they actually gained a little bit of lung function. Um, the pseudomonas positive, PF negative, lost a little bit. And then in the patients with PF, we split them, as we were looking at it, we saw that there was kind of a variability. And so we split them into those with really high PF levels and those with low, and that was defined by more, more than two logs of PF in relation to pseudomonas, so an, an airway where there's a lot of phage being produced. And those patients had a significantly higher drop in lung function um, or decline in lung function over time. And this was um, analyzed, you know, accounting for repeated measures, and this effect was independent of modulator use. So indicating that these patients appear, appear to have more detriment to their lung, infect, or their lung function. And then we also looked at cytokines. Um, and this was from the sputum. Um, we also, in this, in this part of the study, we included 10 healthy controls um, induced sputum, which kind of gives you a nice um, control here. Um, and it was, a, it was a large cytokine panel, so I'm just going to show you some of the interesting ones. But um, we did see that there was some um, increase in inflammatory activity. So IL-1 beta, um, you know, well described as being elevated in CF sputum, and you can see in all three of our CF groups. Again, here we have healthy controls, pseudomonas negative, pseudomonas positive, PF negative, and the double positives. The CFs are all all quite elevated, but the PF positive was significantly elevated in comparison to the other two groups. I only showed uh, statistical significance on the comparison of the PF positive and PF negative because it's, I think, of the most interest and it was pretty complicated with all the, all the comparisons. And then IL-6, which is also a um, pro-inflammatory cytokine, but not one that's consistently or, or um, it's not really uh, described as being elevated in, in CF sputum. Um, we again saw it was elevated in the PF positive versus the PF negative. But then we also see a little bit of an, uh, what might be an antiviral response, given phage is a virus. <laughs> um, so IL-8, which you know, is an, um, well known to be elevated in CF sputum, and you can see it is in all of the, um, the CF groups, it was actually decreased in the phage positive um, group in comparison to the other CF patients, which was kind of interesting. And then IL-10, which is an immunomodulatory um, cytokine and also involved in an antiviral response, which classically or, or, or in the literature has been described as actually being low in CF sputum, although I will say our other CF groups don't necessarily look like they're lower than the healthy controls, but, but our PF positive group was higher than, um, than the other two CF groups. Um, so indicating that potentially the, the host is responding to the presence of virus in their airway. So in summary, um, phage is present in clinical sputum, or in, in <laughs> is present in CF sputum, um, is associated with a decline in lung function over time. It's associated with an inflammatory cytokine response as well as a potentially an antiviral cytokine response. Um, phage may play a role in the pathogenesis of chronic pseudomonas in the CF airway, and PF phage is a potential biomarker and therapeutic target in chronic pseudomonas infection. And um, I will be at poster 94 with this data later. I also have another talk on PFH in the next session where I look at um, mucociliary clearance in, a, um, in cell culture in an ex vivo model. So if you want to hear more about PFH. And then I do want to thank all of the people that have supported this work. So I did all this work at Stanford. So the Stanford CF team under Carlos Mila, um, the Boyke Lab, all of my funding sources, and then my, my new team at CHLA, a small lab right now, and I have our, our clinical team on there as well as my collaborators in ID then my family and my two family members with CF who continue to inspire me. And with that, I will happily take questions. I do have a question. Yeah. Thank you for your great talk, Liz. I totally appreciate it. What is the, do we know anything about the trigger of what causes the phage to, you know? To be produced? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, I mean, you know, classically antibiotic stress kind of has, it causes phage to be induced or, or um, produced. I will say when we work with PF phage in lab, it is very inconsistent. It's like sometimes we can get mitomycin to do it, sometimes we can get putrescine to do it, sometimes DNA can do it. Um, I've, I've also been banking a lot of clinical strains, and so I'm trying to, to isolate the phage from the clinical strains. And like, it has been very difficult to work with this particular phage. And it's also hard because it's not lytic, so it's also hard to look for it. Right. <laughs> um, it does, if you have a lot of it, it will pr produce plaque, so you can look for it. But it's it's um, it's one of the things that we're we're still trying to figure out. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. If you don't mind uh, introducing yourself yes. and asking your question. Uh, Catherine Armbruster from Dartmouth. Um, awesome talk. I'm curious about the Pseudomonas that doesn't harbor PF phage. Is it known... Um, you know, is there anything different about those bugs and that maybe could link to the differences in patient outcomes? Yeah, um, I mean, not any. So when we initially looked at that cross-sectional study, we saw a lot of difference in antibiotic resistance in the two groups, with the PFH being more resistant. I will say in the longitudinal data, it's not necessarily bored out. Although our, also our micro lab at Stanford stopped doing clin um, susceptibilities, like we only do them once a year now. So I also don't have a lot of data <laughs> on that, which is hard. But um, But as far as like, like what's the receptor? I don't even know. Like how uh, does type four pillus. Okay, how it gets okay. in. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, we're still. I have a lot of, of pseudomonas sequences too that I'm now starting to sort through. So I'm kind of trying to get at some of that stuff, but I don't know at this point. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Um, based on your qPCR data, you said that it was really high. I'm just curious. Um, it, are you seeing higher uh, bacteria loads in those who are, or in terms of dead cells, in those who are on um, CFTR modulator therapy? Seeing more, sorry, seeing more what? dead cells picked dead up cells? by the PS, um, the qPCR. Um, I can't say I looked at that. Okay, yeah. Hi, Liz. Uh, Peter Jorth from Cedar sinai Great talk. Um, I'm just wondering, have you guys ever looked at phage in pseudomonas that are eradicated versus those that cause chronic infection? Yeah, Is there that's, any association? that's one thing I'm really interested in, because I, I, I think that probably if a young child acquires a phage-producing strain, they're probably less likely to eradicate it. Right. Um, it within our Stanford cohort, we didn't have enough incidents of, you know, and, and actually capturing sputum at the time somebody um, acquires pseudomonas. So I haven't looked at it yet. We yeah. did look with Valerie Waters, who I think is in here somewhere. One of her, um, we, did, we did look in one of her uh, studies to look for the sequence of PF phage and the ones that, and we didn't see, in that time we didn't see anything that looked like it stood out, but it is another question that I'm really interested in. Cool, great, yeah. thanks. Mm -hmm. Hello, great talk, um, as usual. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you showed that the phage positive uh, colonies are, are mucoid. Have you looked at the other mucoid markers? I mean, for PSL or PEL or, or alginate? I mean, is there some sort of specific or preferential up, up regulation of those? Yeah, I haven't. That's a good question and probably something we should look into, especially now that we have more of the isolates banked. Um, but no, we haven't. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Huh. Great. Thank you, Liz. Appreciate it. Yay. Okay, we'll bring up Lily. Great. So this is um, Lily Charpentier. She's from the Giselle School of Medicine at Dartmouth. The title of her talk is Pathogenesis of, oh, sorry, Host Pathogen Interactions in a Cystic Fibrosis Polymicrobial Infection Model. Thank you, Lily. All right. There we go. Great. All righty. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Lily, and thank you for the introduction. Today, I'd like to present some preliminary data I have on this host pathogen interaction model. Doesn't go for. Yeah. Okay. No Nothing to disclose. All right, so the CF lung is a complex microbial community, which requires more biologically relevant models in order to study host pathogen interactions. I'd like to begin with some 16S rRNA sequencing data, which can demonstrate the great diversity of microbes that colonize the CF lung. So I hope you can appreciate the great amount of color in this graph uh, throughout each of the different patients. This data from 2012 predates the use of HEMTs, but a more recent study demonstrates that these complex communities aren't lost with trikafta treatment. In this 
uh, second graph, each group of two bars demonstrates bacterial genera found in patients before and after Trikafta. So despite the use of HEMT to improve patient outcomes, people with CF do maintain chronic polymicrobial lung infections. But the need for relevant models extends beyond taking into account the polymicrobial community. We also need to consider the environment in which they reside. The use of artificial sputum medium, or ASM, in an in an anoxic growth environment is a more representative model of the CF lung than some previously used models. The Whiteley Group in Georgia has developed an artificial sputum medium that more accu accurately resembles the gene expression of Pseudomonas aeruginosa directly isolated from patient sputum than grown in microbiological media. In their 2020 paper on synthetic sputum medium, they compared the gene expression of Pseudomonas PAO1, grown in different media and environments, to that of PA freshly isolated from patient sputum. They found their SCFM2 formulation most accurately replicated the gene expression of Pseudomonas uh, freshly isolated. So this was measured as the fraction of PAO1 genome that has expression within two standard deviations of the average expression in the sputum samples and is in the uh, little chart here as AS2. For example, their SCFM2 had an AS2 of about 86%, while Pseudomonas in LB was only around 80%. But the nutrients available in the lung environment aren't the only contributor to uh, microbial gene expression. It's also been observed that the mucus plugs in the CF lung can reach anoxia. As an example, this is a fiber optic bronchoscopy of a patient lung in which they inserted an oxygen probe into a mucus plug, the point of which is illustrated by the black arrow. When inserted into the mucus plug, the oxygen content quickly drops and increases again as the probe is removed from the mucus at approximately the 50 minute mark. So although people with CF have multi-species lung infections, Almost all published studies focus on single species infection models with bacteria grown in standard media such as LB and in the presence of normoxia, conditions that don't re fully represent the polymicrobial infections in people with CF. Therefore, understanding the impact of chronic infections on the host immune response requires studies involving polymicrobial communities grown under biologically relevant conditions. Based on these observations, we and our collaborators at the O'Toole Lab at Dartmouth had, have developed a polymicrobial infection model to study pathogen-pathogen and host-pathogen interactions. <clears throat> so work done primarily by Dr. Tom Hampton and Dr. Fabrice Jean-Pierre in the Stanton and O'Toole Labs at Dartmouth have resulted in a four-species model community that represents microbes found in 34% of people with CF. Publicly available 16S gene amplicon sequencing data from 167 people with CF were used to re identify a representative set of microbial lung communities to use as a model polymicrobial culture. In this cohort, 10 microbial taxa achieved rel relatively high abundance and prevalence within this cohort. From these, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Staph aureus, Streptococcus, and Prevotella were selected as members of a model mixed community for a few reasons. Number one, they're within these top 10 uh, prevalent and abundant microbes. Uh, all four of them are also important in shaping health outcomes in people with CF, and this is based on studies using culture dependent and independent approaches. There's also evidence uh, for the potential for two or more of these microorganisms to be found together in the CF airway and lead to worsened clinical outcomes, as well as being in close physical proximity in the airway. Uh, work done by the O'Toole Lab using metabolic modeling also indicates that these were our top contributors to cross-fed metabolites in communities detected in the CF lung. So the abundance of these four genera in the airway could be explained by predicted metabolic cross-feeding among the four microorganisms. So this polymicrobial community composed of these four microbes was selected as the basis for the development of an in vitro model system. The O2 lab is currently examining bacteria-bacteria interactions and antibiotic resistance in this polymicrobial culture, and we're studying how the polymicrobial community affects the phenotype and gene expression of host human bronchial epithelial cells. So how are we doing this specifically? Well, while colonizing the CF lung, Pseudomonas and other bacteria reside suspended in the mucus layer 
above lung epithelia. And since most of these bacteria reside in the CF mucus and aren't in direct contact with epithelial cells, our lab has shown that bacteria communicate with human bronchial epithelial cells, or HBC, uh, by secreting bacterial extracellular vesicles, which I'll refer to as BEVs. These vesicles are spheroid proteoliposomes that diffuse through the mucus and fuse with host cells, delivering virulence factors and sRNAs that suppress the immune response of HBC to infection. Uh, for example, our lab has shown that outer membrane vesicles secreted by Pseudomonas aeruginosa contain virulence factors uh, that suppress the HBC inflammatory response. So this, for example, Pseudomonas OMBs contain SIF, a protein that reduces CFTR chloride secretion, exacerbating the CF phenotype, as well as sRNAs that reduce the inflammatory response compared to OMVs that lack the sRNA in an in vivo mouse model. An example of this is illustrated in the graph, in the uh, slide here, uh, in which Pseudomonas OMVs deliver an siRNA that inhibits the MAP kinase pathway, thus reducing IL-8 secretion by HBC and decreasing neutrophil recruitment to infection. Furthermore, BEVs have a similar effect on HBC as whole bacteria. Prelim preliminary RNA-seq analysis from our lab indicates that there are no significant differences in immune pathway activation in HBEC treated with either Pseudomonas aeruginosa whole bacteria or OMVs. This is particularly, particularly advantageous for us when considering our in vitro infection environment. As anoxia damages HBEC, and bacteria will rapidly change transcription when exposed to oxygen, BEVs provide an in vitro model for us to model infection and not worry about the rapid transcriptional changes that would occur with whole bacteria. So we can isolate BEVs from this polymicrobial model grown in ASM and anoxia and use them to study host pathogen interactions. Today, I'd like to show you some of our preliminary data from our approach in which we begin to characterize the vesicles themselves through imaging in 16S relative abundance and then begin to characterize the HBEC response to treat treatment with these BEVs through CFTR chloride secretion, cytokines, and eventually RNA-seq. So to begin with the vesicles themselves, we observe a heterogeneous mixture of vesicles when imaged by negative stain TEM. This is a variety of shapes and sizes I hope you can appreciate, especially in the top of two images. Further evidence that we're, we are observing vesicles from our polymicrobial culture are in the bottom two panels, in which we observed vesicles in a formation that we have seen in our previous research of pseudomonas vesicles in monoculture. We also see this heterogeneity in species composition of our vesicles as well. On the left-hand side, we have a graph displaying the relative abundance of CFUs from each bacterium in our polymicrobial culture. Each is roughly in equal abundance, a little less prevotella than the others, but as a preliminary measure of relative abundances of each bacterium in our vesicle preparation, we decided to turn to 16S sequencing, as we have found ribosomal RNA in vesicles previously. When assessing relative abundance by 16S, we do not find the same distribution of bugs in our culture or in our vesicle prep as we had in our CFUs. As I mentioned, this is a very preliminary measure, and we are currently working on other methods of more accurately elucidating the relative abundances of each bacterium in our BEV preparation. But this does tell us one thing, and that is that we do in fact have vesicles from each species, which we will use to treat the HBC in vitro. So before we begin characterization of the HBEC response, we wanted to make sure we weren't just killing ourselves with these BEVs. So we wanted to make sure they aren't cytotoxic, and good thing they aren't. Uh, the HBCs we use are primary cells, so they do secrete mucus, making them an ideal model for the lung environment in which BEVs would travel through and interact with host cells. We preliminarily measured cell, cytotox cell cytotoxicity by lactate dehydrogenase release measured at 490 nanometers, and we find that in both uh, CF cells and CF uh, cells treated with ETI, 
uh, there is no significant difference in cell cytotoxicity between our polymicrobial BEVs, which are labeled poly BEVs, and our process control, PC, which is an uninoculated media control that has been put through the vesicle isolation process at the same time as the polymicrobial BEVs. So one of our first questions was to see if these BEVs had any effect on CF terris chloride secretion by HBEC. And we find that they do decrease chloride secretion in both wild types, so non-CF, and CF cells treated with ETI. Chloride secretion was uh, assessed by measuring short circuit current, ISC, using oozing chambers. And so this was a very interesting response. So next, we wanted to see, do any of the cytokines that we might expect also increase uh, with treatment by BEVs? And the first two we thought of were IL-6 and IL-8. And to our surprise, we did not see a significant increase in CFHPEC secretion of either IL-6 or IL-8 with treatment with our polymicrobial BEVs. But there are a couple other pro-inflammatory cytokines that we did see increases in. And a couple examples of these are fractalkine and TNF-alpha. So despite our unexpected results with IL-6 and IL-8, we do see an increase of other pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, the increase in secretion of fractalkine, CXCL3, which increases chemotaxis of monocytes and lymphocytes to the lung, and TNF-alpha, which increases inflammation. And although these increases were only significant in the non-ETI-treated CF cells, the ETI-treated CFHBC did trend similarly. So, so far, we've concluded that the co-culture model, model secretes BEVs from each of the four species, that these BEVs decrease CFTR chloride secretion by primary HBC, and that these BEVs selectively stimulate pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion, such as fractalkine and TNF-alpha. In the future, we have an RNA-seq analysis of the HBC response uh, to treatment with polymicrobial BEVs. That's underway, and it just missed this presentation, so very excited to see those results soon. And we are also working to develop a more complex model to include endothelial cells and immune cells. So I'd like to thank my lab for everything um, with this project. Also, particular thank you to Dr. Fabrice Jean-Pierre, who developed this polymicrobial model, and the University of Vermont Microscopy Corps for the great images and the funding sources. So. Thank you so much for your great talk. Um, I do have a question. How do you, how relevant is it in the lung? Like, do they, do you quantify BEVs in the lungs of patients? Too? And is it representative here in your in vitro? Yeah, it's difficult to quantify in the lung just um, for everything that's happening in the sputum. Mm -hmm. It would be very interesting. We do have patient sputum samples um, that I also didn't show here that we also ran 16S on. Uh, and so it's hard to quantify exactly how many uh, are in there. Uh, these four bugs were among the top four in uh, a couple of our patients' uh, clinical samples as well, though. Uh, Thank you. Hi, that was very nice. Sarah Clark from University of Colorado. Um, I'm wondering, one of the advantages of these mixed community models is that now you can tease apart individual contributions of you know one species and then look also at polymicrobial interactions, mm -hmm. right? by kind of changing up the mixture. So I'm just curious if you had plans to kind of look at what happens when one is missing, then do you see those expected differences maybe in IL-8 because that like one's increasing and one's decreasing, for mm. example? Yeah, uh, that's a little bit diff uh, difficult with this model. The O'Toole Lab uh, and Fabrice has done a lot, a lot of experiments uh, depending on, oh, if you take one out, uh, how much do the others survive, so on. Um, there is a complication with this model in that Prevotella uh, does not grow in monoculture in a this ASM and anoxic model. Uh, so it's difficult to take out like one species and do each individually. Also, there's a lot of uh, metabolite cross-feedings. It's hard to tell uh, how that might affect their different growth with the other bugs compared to monoculture. It's something I definitely would like to try to tease out and work on, but it's a work in progress to see if that would work. Yeah, thanks. 
Thank you. Hello, very interesting. Barbara Kai from Münster, Germany. So my question would be, uh, do you know anything about the contents of these vesicles? And uh, if so, do you think they will change once uh, once they are in this polymicrobial communi community? Mm -hmm. A very interesting question. Yeah. Um, one of something I would like to do on the vesicles, I don't know all of the contents at the moment. Um, we could do, there are a lot of small RNAs, for example, and microRNAs generally in these vesicles. Uh, I would like to do some small RNA seq on the vesicles themselves to see what might be in there for those contents. Mm. Um, and, and once they are in the polymicrobial community, do you think there's a difference? There could be. I think it's a bit hard to tell, especially since uh, it's hard to do the comparison of the monoculture versus the polymicrobial yeah. culture with Prevotella making that difficult for us. Okay. But it would be very interesting. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Lily, for taking it. Okay. So our next speaker, um, Dr. Camille Eyre from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Medicine. And her talk is on uh, CFTR modulators increase viral mobility in healthy and CF airway epithelial cells. Good morning, everyone. I would like to start by thanking the moderators for inviting me to give a talk on uh, CFTR modulators and their effect on viral mobility uh, in vitro. We are using healthy and CF airway epithelial cells. So here is my disclosure slide. I have a funded Vertex Research Innovation Award, uh, but this is unrelated to this work. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit here and talk about viruses. Um, I'm going to focus mostly for this talk on uh, respiratory syncytial virus um, in CF. We have similar results with SARS-CoV-2, uh, however, working and doing the same assays in a BSL-3 facility is sometimes very difficult. So I prefer to focus on the results that we have done uh, with RSV here. So we know that people with CF are commonly uh, infected with uh, respiratory virus uh, infections and about 40% of CF exacerbations are linked to a viral, an initial viral infection. So um, we also know that RSV is associated with prolonged uh, hospitalizations, use of antibiotics uh, and also a a rapid decline in lung function. We know from the literature that RSV worsens the mucoobstructive phenotype in CF and also by having impaired mucociliary clearance in CF, we can have this persistence of those viruses in the lungs in CF. So our goal here was to try to understand using in vitro models how viruses move uh, in response to modulator compounds and also comparing healthy versus CF cultures. Here I'm showing you images of uh, a non-CF culture that was infected with RSV and we see the progression of the virus over time, over a four day period. You can see here that uh, with the HNE staining, the HNE uh, staining, you can see that we have remodeling of this epithelium over time. This starts to be very severe around three days. Uh, right around that time, you have uh, goblet cell degranulation. You can see it here with the ABPS staining, as well as the uh, IHC staining. We are using MUC5AC as a marker of goblet cells here. You can see that after four days, we have also a lot of mucus that is extracellular. So really infection uh, triggers this mucin granule degranulations. Uh, what I want to stress is also that um, we don't have a strong tropism for goblet cells with this virus, which is the same for SARS-CoV-2. Mostly uh, ciliated cells will be infected. 
We use electron microscopy, as you can see here, uh, scanning electron microscopy micrographs showing the apical region of these uh, infected cultures, which we have a lot of damage of the ciliated cells. You can see here that we have a full shed ciliated cell. And that um, also using TEM, here I'm showing you a mock cell with very organized cilia, basal bodies. However, when we have infected cells within three days, we start having a lot of cilial damage. We have disorganization of the cilia, popping uh, of the apical membrane, as well as uh, disorganization of the basal bodies. So you can imagine that within those three to four days of infection, you're going to have a lot of difficulties to clear the virus out of the lungs when you have so much damage on your ciliated cells. So to look at the progression in vitro of the virus, we use a GFP tagged uh, RSV virus. And you can see here the images of this, um, the progression of the virus in the culture. We also looked at the response in mucus secretion uh, in the name of like MUC5AC and MUC5B uh, using a Western blot. These are, these are not the prettiest, but uh, that tells you a little bit when you secrete mucus. So you can see, uh, I want to bring to your attention that we are in enclosed systems. So when we are in vitro, the viruses that are moving more, they go round and round and round, finding the next cells to infect, which is very different than when you are in your lungs. In the lungs, you will have mucociliary clearance that when it's effective, it's going to go to, toward the glottis. You're going to spit out the viruses and the mucus out. This is not the case in vitro. So I want to bring your attention to that because more viral load doesn't necessarily mo means more replication. It also means that we are moving more into this enclosed system. So um, this is where, where it's very difficult talking about that uh, in the next steps. But you can see viral progression. Again, we have a peak in viral uh, load as shown here by the mRNA content and the viral progression peaks around three days of infection. The same is true for the mucin signal. We peak around three days and uh, therefore we looked at this knowing that we have more mucus. We looked at the mucus ciliary transport uh, as nebulizing fluorescent bead on our cultures that are transporting effectively and you can see that we go from about 35 microns per second as the velocity of the mucus to about of over 60 microns per second. So we almost doubled the velocity around three days uh, of infection. So things are moving faster. Again, this is in a non-CF culture. So we looked at the ASL height measurements because you know that to move mucus out, you need hydration. And so I'm showing you here these Z-stack images uh, of a dextran red labeled ASL and uh, the quantitation at the bottom. And we used both a live RSV virus and a UV inactivated RSV virus. We used in black uh, normal cells or healthy cells and CF cells at the bottom. Again, I want to bring to your attention that we have a peak in ASL height with the live virus only, not the UV inactivated virus, at three days post inoculation in non-CF cells. In CF cells, we do not see that peak, meaning that probably we don't have this flush of um, hydration around that time. So um, there have been papers showing direct interaction between uh, RSV and the ENAC sodium channel. We are working with EHS to get approved in BSL2 plus to do oozing chamber. But the best I can do right now was to show you mRNA um, expression of the, the, the channels. So you can see you don't have an increase on CFTR. The, what we found was a decrease in beta and gamma subunit of the sodium channel. That was for the normal cells. 
Here I'm showing you what we are getting with infected CF cells. We do not have that decrease uh, of the beta and gamma sodium channel, suggesting that really that downregulation of ENAC goes through the activity of CFTR. Failing to move water probably fail also compromises the viral particle displacement into the culture. So here we are looking at the viral progression in non-CF and CF cultures. And indeed, it was impaired severely uh, in our CF cultures. So um, here I showed you earlier the mucociliary transport inside the non-CF cells. I'm showing you here mucociliary transport in CF cells before and after RSV infection. I don't know if you remember the numbers, but after RSV infection, we were going all the way above like 60 micrograms per ml, uh, per seconds, I'm sorry, micrometer per seconds. Um, here we have a slight increase in MCT with RSV infection, probably unrelated to CFTR, um, but it's not drastic, although we go from not moving to moving somewhat. We know that ETI will correct, will drop percent solids in CF cultures and increase mucus velocity. So what we did is we treated those uh, non-infected and infected CFTR, CF cells, and you can see that ETI maximized the viral mobility, um, the viral, the, the mucociliary clearance uh, in these cultures. So we looked also at the mucus because we know mucus is adherent in CF cultures. So now here I'm showing you non-CF and uh, CF cultures. Uh, and we removed the mucus by washing the cell surfaces. This had very minimal impact uh, in the non-CF cultures. And we saw a change in the viral mobility in CF cultures. Again, I want you to look at those are reverse norm um, numbers because we are talking about cross points here, but we are increasing uh, viral mobility in CF, but not to the level of uh, non-CF cultures. When we treat with ETI, now we are maximizing really viral mobility in vitro, uh, whether we are lo looking at uh, non-CF or CF cells. Washing now, it now doesn't uh, have any impact uh, on these cultures. So ETI really seems to move things around viruses, but you can think that probably for bacteria, that would be the same. So here we are uh, looking at the extent of the GFP signal. How far is my GFP signal going into a culture? So we are looking uh, in the presence and absence of washings, as well as in the presence and absence of ETI. Those are CF cells. And you can see that washing helps somewhat uh, the, the progression of this GFP signal within a, a given culture. Um, and then ETI significantly increased uh, that progression of the GFP signal. Surprisingly, when we looked at non-CF cultures, you can see that watching increases a little bit, uh, the progression of GFP, but ETI in non-CF cells also increased viral progression in our in vitro cultures. So um, we also, for patients that are not eligible to uh, take ETI or other highly effective modulators. We treated our CF cultures with hypertonic saline as a way to hydrate uh, the cultures. And you can see here that over a one week period of time where we treated the cells, we nebulized the cells with an e-flow for about five minutes every day. Uh, you can see that the progression of the RSV GFP uh, signal is greater, at least to the same level as the non-CF cells uh, here uh, in, in this treated culture daily. So basically, um, when, when 
maybe we have uh, patients that are not tolerating ETI very well. They could privately take ETI for a couple of days, maybe three or four days, the time they can clear infection uh, or really be very um, careful with their hypertonic saline treatment to really try to move the viruses out of the lungs before they maintain persistence in the lungs. So here are my conclusions. Uh, RSV preven preferentially infects ciliated cells and causes severe epithelial remodeling. Uh, and these infections stimulate mucin secretion and increase mucociliary transport. Uh, that increase in mucociliary transport correlates with a peak in ASL height and a downregulation of the ENAC sodium channel. CF cells fail to adjust hydration in response to these RSV infections. So consequently, the viral transport is compromised in CF cultures. Uh, ETI and daily hypertonic saline treatment improve RSV mobility in our CF cultures. ETI also facilitates the, the mobility of RSV in non-CF cultures. On that, I would like to thank the people in my lab that are currently working on uh, this project and the former people in my lab, Kendall and, and Jason, that have started this project. I also would like to thank Dr. Pickles that is uh, countlessly infecting uh, cells for us and also the imaging core facilities that are helping us with those imaging uh, techniques. Thank you so much. If you have questions, please. Hi, I'm Paula Zamora from Darmos. Um, do you know if ETI changes the amount of um, like ciliated cells or like receptor like availability for RSV and that's why in your non-CF cells you also see an increase? So for, I can answer that for SARS-CoV-2 that uses the ACE2 receptor. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not see a change in ACE2 with ETI treatment. Ciliated cells number remains similar. What we see is the bending of the cilia doesn't occur anymore after C ETI treatment. We have erected cilia that are able to really beat uh, with ETI. So that's for the number of cells, ciliated cells. Um, for RSV, we are not, this virus doesn't necessarily enter the cells with a um, receptor. Some people think there is one, others think there is none. Knockout receptor cells are still getting infected. So we don't think that's really the case, uh, uh, that we are changing receptor or ciliated cell number, uh, if that answers your question for that. Yeah, thank you. And we see the same things with different viruses. Also. Camille, thank you so much. That was okay. so great. Wait, I have a question. Yep. <laughs> you know your um, RSV, like, uh, did you only test it with one type of RSV or did yes. you dead it yeah, with others we, as well we mostly, to see the same? Yeah, we mostly work with only one line of RSV. Yes. Do you think it would be different if you, your outcomes, if you did some mm. other RSV? Since we are just testing NL63, other coronaviruses, influenza viruses, uh, and SARS-CoV-2, and just one line of RSV, but seeing similar things, I would say that probably it would be the same, but I'm not, yeah. I just can't yeah. be very sure about that. Great, thank you. All right. Okay, well, come. We'll uh, invite Rebecca up here. So this is uh, Rebecca Valls. She's from Dartmouth uh, College. And um, her title is, um, where is it? Intestinal Bacterioides Modulate Systemic Infection and the Microbial Ecology in a Mouse Model of CF, Evidence for Propionate Reducing Inflammatory Cytokines and Impacting Colonization. Oh, you shortened it. Oh. Yeah, I did. Okay, I did. That was okay. a long one, but I appreciate great. you going through yes. the whole thing for me. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Rebecca. I'm a six-year PhD student in the lab of Dr. George O'Toole at Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. And I want to thank um, the moderators for inviting me to present my work to you all today. And then thank you, of course, for coming to an early session. 
Um, okay, so I'll go in and say that there's no relationships I'd like to disclose at this time. And I'd like to explain why it is that we are interested in looking at the microbes in the gut in a disease that so often focuses on the microbes in the lungs. And that's because our collaborators at DHMC, Dr. Annie Owen and Dr. Juliet Madon, were working with a cohort of infants with cystic fibrosis, about 40 infants. And they saw this interesting observation where uh, infants that were being breastfed were actually um, had, had less pulmonary outcomes. And so they around that time, people were really looking at how being breastfed was affecting the gut microbiome. So they decided to look at um, how the gut microbiome in these infants might affect pulmonary outcomes. And so that's what I'm showing you here. On the y-axis is the proportion of infants with cystic fibrosis with without CF exacerbation over their age. And then these colored lines here are indicating the SDI or Shannon Diversity Index. This is an indication of how microbially diverse a community is. And what I hope you can appreciate from this plot is that as the uh, microbial community in their stool samples are more diverse or higher, or higher number, then the longer time to the first exacerbation these infants would have. And this trend also existed when they looked at the proportion of infants without pseudomonas colonization, whereby the more diverse the microbial communities in their stool samples, then the longer time to that event. And so what that told us is that this increased diversity of the microbial communities in their sample, in their stool samples, was associated with a prolonged period of health in this cohort of infants with cystic fibrosis. And so our lab, in collaboration with the lab of Dr. Benjamin Ross, also at Dartmouth, we're interested in understanding better the uh, differences in the microbial communities between um, infants with cystic fibrosis and infants without. And so we submitted stool samples from the same cohort for metagenomic sequencing. And here I'm showing you the top phylum um, by relative abundance when you compare the cohort of infants with cystic fibrosis at Dartmouth to a previously published dive immune study of infants without cystic fibrosis. And there's a lot of interesting things that they found here, but the main difference that I want to point out here is the decrease in relative abundance of the phylum back toward ETs, which is indicated by this burnt orange bar here. And this support has previously been shown in CF mouse models and other cohorts, which is where in um, CF stool samples, you have a decrease of relative abundance of bacteroides. And so that led us to hypothesize that bacteroides in the gut impacts clinical airway outcomes in children with CF through the gut lung axis. And the way that we um, set out to test this hypothesis was first by an answering the question, how does intestinal bacteroides play a role in CF? And to do this, a previous graduate student in our lab, Courtney Price, developed developed an in vitro system for testing the effects of bacteroides on the human gut, where we grow um, in anaerobic conditions, different strains of bacteroides overnight, and then we filter sterilize them to separate the bacteria from what they're secreting. And then we put those on those supernatants, along with I1 beta to stimulate inflammation onto um, CF colon epithelial cells. And then we wait a certain period of time and we collect the supernatant and run them through an ELISA or Luminex panel to um, quantify the secretion of different cytokines that are being secreted by the human cells after exposure to bacterial supernatants. And so I'm showing you here um, the results of that of, the, of one of the initial ELISAs that we did where we're measuring the IL-8 being secreted by these human colon epithelial cells. And I, before we get into um, what the bacteria, the effect the bacteria had, I just wanna point out that when we have just media alone, there is no secretion of IL-8 um, or very little secretion, but then when we add media, when we add IL-1 beta to the media, we get the significant increase in IL-8 secretion. And then when we add the bacterial supernatants, regardless of what species they are indicated by the color, or whether it's a clinical or a lab strain of bacteroides, we see this decrease in IL-8 secretion um, from the colon epithelial cells. So what that told us is that bacteroides is secreting something that's associated with a downregulation of IL-8 secretion from CF CACO2 cells. So that led us to ask the question, would, can we recapitulate this, um, this downregulatory effect that bacteroides has in a CF mouse model? And so we, worked with CF mice, and I'm showing you here this timeline of the mouse experiment, where we allow the mice to establish in the mouse facility for about two weeks. We collect fecal samples to get an idea of what their baseline gut microbiome looks like. And then we treat them with antibiotics to, to treat, to, I'm sorry, deplete their local microflora. And then we gavage um, into their intestines CF stool plus or minus bacteroides. We allow those bacteroides to engraft or establish for about two weeks. And then we 
um, hit the mice with a pulmonary LPS challenge, wait 24 hours, and then we sack them and we collect um, blood and other samples to get an idea of the systemic inflammation in these mice. Before I get into the results, I just want to show you how we prepare that gavage where we create the CF stool pool, which is a combination of stool samples from three patients from cystic fibrosis. We um, spin that down, collect the um, supernatant, and then we combine PBS to one, gavage that into the intestines of mice, and that is our minus bacteroides group. And then we, in the, another supernatant, we add three different strains of bacteroides and gavage that into mice, and that's our plus bacteroides group. And in case anyone's interested, we have sequenced the CF stool pool, and it's about 99% E. coli. Okay, so we uh, first just confirmed that bacteroides were indeed um, establishing in the gut. So I'm showing you here bacteroides, bacteroides relative abundance by 16S sequencing in that baseline. So before we hit them in antibiotics, there's no significant difference between our mouse groups on how much bacteroides there is in the gut. And then after day one, day one after we introduce bacteroides, we see significantly more relative abundance of bacteroides in our plus bacteroides group, and that persists on to day nine of the experiment. So that's good. Bacteroides are there in the gut. And then at the end, like I said, we collect serum to get an idea of the systemic inflammatory response to the LPS with or without bacteroides in the intestines. And so I'm showing you here the concentration of KC, which is the mouse version of IL-8, a pro-inflammatory cytokine. Um, and you can see that in the group of mice that had bacteroides supplementation, they're, sig they're significantly less um, pro-inflammatory cytokines systemically. And this um, persisted also with three other pro-inflammatory cytokines, whereby the presence of bacteroides in the intestines was able to modulate the um, concentration of systemic pro-inflammatory cytokines. So that led us to ask the question now, what is bacteroides secreting that can regulate inflammation or pro-inflammatory cytokine secretion in the human cells and in the mice? And so to address this, we again grew up different strains of bacteroides, filter sterilized them and sent them in for metabolomics. And that identified about 71 metabolites. And I'm summarizing a lot of work here, um, but we did a screen with these 71 metabolites where we put them onto human KGO colon cells and um, looked for which ones downregulated IL-8 um, in a concentration that was clinically relevant to what has previously been published for those metabolites that were actually, um, that we already had those numbers for. And then we also wanted to make sure that these metabolites weren't just killing our cells. So we also um, made sure that they weren't cytotoxic um, to the cells. And so in summary, we, we chose propionate to move forward with. We did identify several different metabolites, but we thought propionate was a really strong candidate and so we worked. With, um, we reached out to a collaborator, Dr. Eric Martins, who had wonderfully already created a strain of bacteroides that did not secrete propionate. And so we wanted to confirm in our conditions that these strains were not secreting propionate. So I'm showing you here propionate on the y-axis in just media alone. It's below detection. And then the parent strain of bacteroides um, is secreting propionate. And then this bacteroides TDK strain, which is just a count, TDK is just a counter selection marker for the final mutant, that's still secreting propionate. Then when we deleted, or I'm sorry, when Eric Martin's lab deleted the PRP genes, it's four different genes involved in the pathway of uh, making propionate out of succinate, we see that no propionate is being secreted. And so then we wanted to see how these strains that do and do not secrete propionate would affect IL-8 secretion from our um, CF colon cells. And what we saw is that, I'm showing you here IL-8 on the y-axis, is that, of course, in media alone with IL-1 beta, we have a high secretion of IL-8. When we add the bacteroides strain, that IL-8 is downregulated. When we add the other um, parent strain of B-theta TDK that's secreting propionate, that IL-8 is downregulated. However, when we treat the cells with, with supernatant from a bacteroides strain that is not secreting propionate, that downregulatory effect goes away. And so we wanted to see if this persisted in a mouse model as we did before. So the question here is, does bacteroides PRP that does not, so bacteroides strain that does not secrete propionate downregulate cytokine levels in pulmonary challenged mice? And so now this is, um, so it's the same timeline of mouse experiment, but this time when we prepare our gavage, we have two groups of mice where the first one has B-theta TDK, so that's secreting propionate, so that's our TDK group of mice. And then our other group is the B-theta PRP that does not secrete propionate, and that's our PRP group of mice. And we wanted to first um, confirm that our mice were 
there are two treatment groups of mice who are actually um, getting um, inoculated with our two strains. And so this is showing you a standard method for measuring bacteroides in stool samples where we plate them on blood agar with um, gentamicin because bacteroides are inherently resistant to gentamicin. We see that at baseline, there's no significant difference to, between our groups. When we hit the mice with antibiotics, of course, CFUs go way down. And then soon after engraftment, we see no significant difference between CFUs and then at SAC, um, at sacrifice, we see no significant difference. And then also towards the end of the experiment on day 13, we sent in stool samples for quantifying absolute abundance of bacteroides by 16S using a, a spike in of a really uncommon microbe. It's a common method to measure absolute abundance of microbes in stool samples. And we see again that towards the end of the experiment, there's no significant difference in establishment of our two bacteroides strains in our group of mice. And so what we saw in the end when we collected um, serum to get an idea of inflammatory response um, in our two treatment groups of mice was that the group of mice that were treated with a PRP strain, so again, bacteroides that's not secreting propionate, has significantly higher amounts of systemic inflammation um, as measured by this pro-inflammatory cytokine KC, and that also persisted in the lungs. However, in the intestines, there was no significant difference in KC concentrations. So what that told us is that although we don't see a significant difference in the regulation of KC by bacteroides secreted propionate, there is a systemic and lung effect. And so from the intestines, bacteroides are able to regulate a fat inflammatory response systemically and in other organs. And so to summarize, um, I'm, I created this little model RPI says that no model is um, good or right, but some are helpful. So hopefully you guys find this a little bit helpful, where if we have a CF mouse model and we um, have in that mouse model either bacteroides that secrete propionate or, um, I'm sorry, or just have bacteria that secrete propionate, then upon LPS challenge, you have a decreased inflammatory cytokine response. However, in a CF mouse where you don't have any propionate or you have, I'm sorry, you don't have any bacteroides or you have bacteroides that aren't secreting propionate, then upon an LPS challenge in the lungs, you get an increased inflammatory cytokine response. And I didn't include this in today's talks, but we have done some pathway analysis based off of the Luminex results from the serum, lungs, and the intestines to see what pathways are overlapping in this gut-lung axis. And we identified AMB2 neutrophil pathway as being involved in the regulation of bacteroide-secreted propionate to um, LPS response in the lungs. And with that, I'd like to um, thank my lab, especially my advisor, Dr. George O'Toole, and my colleagues, Caitlin, Melissa, and Sarvesh, we call ourselves the Poop Pals. Um, I'd like to thank um, all of our funding um, and NACFC for giving us opportunity to share our science and discuss with all of you awesome scientists. So thank you so much, and I'll take any questions. It's good to have Poop Pals. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Hi there, that was a great talk. Um, I'm a JD Andakar from the University of Washington. Um, do you have a sense of how much bacteroidetes you need to have there? Like what percentage of the microbiota it would have to uh, compose in order to have this effect and how much propionate needs to be uh, produced to, to affect the gut lung access? That's a good question. Um, by relative abundance in some of our in some of our mice, we had as low of an inoculation as like um, thirty five percent, um, and we still saw an effect of it be having a, a lesser systemic pro inflammatory response. Um, I don't know if there's a lower limit than that. That's a good question. Yeah, thank you. So Alessandra Bragonzi from Milano, thank you very much for your talk. Very interesting. I want to know if your uh, CF mice are treated with uh, laxative to rescue gut obstruction, and in that case, uh, if this influences uh, your results. Yeah, thank you for that question. No, we do not treat our mice with laxatives. Um, and for the most part, they are okay. It's actually when we treat them with antibiotics that they um, experience diarrhea. But other than that, they do not I guess die at least within the time frame of our experiment, which is a, a little less than two months. Mm -hmm. 
But are these Delta F and or, 508? Yes, they and are. And they do not have. Uh, uh, they're not got uh, corrected. Got, uh, they are got corrected. Uh, no, they're not got corrected. Or not? <laughs> okay. He said yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. He knows more okay, than I do. Because so. I was very surprised about uh, the absence of uh, obstruction. Okay. Thank you. So with propionate was cool. What about all the others on the list? Is there any other things that were popping out for you? Yeah. Um, so riboflavin also popped up. So did um, acetate and butyrate. We chose to go with propionate because for some of those other metabolites, we would reach a certain concentration that it became toxic to the cells. Um, or we would see that the concentration we needed to actually get a down, um, a down regulatory response to the IL-8 would be a concentration that doesn't match anything that is clinically relevant or not, not it's way like maybe like a hundred times more than what we see published and what's actually in the gut. Oh, wow. So that's why we move forward to propionate, but I definitely, we definitely think that there are other metabolites Great. involved. Great. Yeah. Hey, thanks Rebecca. I'm Dan Argetes from Dartmouth. Uh, I think all the gut lung access is super cool. Um, but the, the problem comes when you try to actually fix that in vivo and, you know, as you know, some of the, trials on probiotics and things like that have been a little disappointing. Mm -hmm. Do you think the bacteroides itself is necessary or do you think we could try something with the metabolites only to try to indirectly influence the microbiome and therefore de decrease inflammation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that if we could deliver propionate straight to the intestines, then yes, I don't know if it would work to directly um, directly put it in the lungs, but I think that whether we have bacteroides secreting the propionate or the propionate delivered directly to the intestine, that could that could help, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, uh, Paul Planet from UPenn. Um, uh, there are bugs that can metabolize short-chain fatty acids. Have you looked at the other bugs in your in your uh, CF microbiomes to see if they have the capacity to metabolize this and make it worse. I see. Yeah, um, we we didn't take the other bugs from the stool samples and run any kind of in vitro experiments. Um, but by 16S sequencing, we do see that there's a decrease in the bugs that can, in general, secrete short chain fatty acids, um, along with the decrease of bacteroides. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Okay, thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.